Okay, this is um, the pre-class video for class number 13. Uh, it's the second day on Confucius, and we're talking about Confucius and political leadership. Um, okay, so the first reading, well, we left off last time. I took analects, I, took, I picked some analects about the good leader, and it was that a leader has to uh, lead by example and have be a person of personal integrity and sort of inspire the people. And um, students reacted to that. I guess I think we're kind of conflicted about that and that can be used to manipulate people or to cover up uh, people's real motives and character. Um, but be that as it may, it's part of the Chinese tradition. And, um, and the point I want to start out with is that our founding fathers liked the Analects. I was very surprised when I read this um, because technically we're based on this notion of rights and individual rights. But um, what they wanted was the American Revolution, right, was in favor of rights and equality because in Europe, um, law was used as a tool to oppress. There was a tremendous class system and religion was also used to oppress. People in power would associate with the church and that would legitimize their power. And so the public would not check under the surface to see if the rulers were really ruling for the benefit of the ruled or not. So um, our founders thought of Confucius Analects as a way to cultivate virtue, all the virtues without having to refer to Christian orthodoxy because they were allowing people into the country who belonged to Christian sects or denominations that were intolerant. So whatever virtue they learn at church, the intolerance has to be left behind when they come into the public square and they try to deal with each other as citizens. Okay, so Confucius virtues focuses on having a way of life, um, self-control, generosity, ruling for the benefit of the ruled that um, you can get without having to refer to God. And that's what they wanted to do. They wanted people to take virtue seriously without necessarily associating that with their religious faith, especially if that was intolerant. So that's their project. Um, so Thomas Jefferson admired um, the leader of China this is all very amazing to me. Um, and Jefferson said this right in an inaugural speech. It's not like this was some secret that he admired the Chinese. <laughs> he said it right out loud um, that they're enlightened by a benign religion. And then uh, Houston Smith, one of the students brought up, is this really a religion or is it just an ethic, right? Okay, so it incul inculcates honesty, truth, temperance, gratitude the love of man, those are all the personal virtues. Um, and they have a, a vague sense of some overriding pro providence, some great harmony, but it's not, um, it's not the Judeo-Christian God. Um, he created, Benjamin Franklin created a United Party for Virtue. At the end of the war, some people wanted to form an order of hereditary knights. So once again, you'd have an entrenched class and he didn't want this. Um, so Franklin cited the Chinese model as everyone has to earn um, their place in society. You have to prove yourself worthy of high office. And, and you wanted people who take on positions of power to have personal, social and political virtues. Um, 
uh, his parents. Okay. So the Chinese, he also wanted to emphasize that you honor the parents um, of citizens that step up and show that they're capable of ruling well. Um, and as opposed to children who just inherit their privilege because they don't have to be virtuous. So the founders, Ben Franklin, wanted to try and create a class of people who, of leaders who earned their way. They did not inherit it. It doesn't matter who your daddy is. What matters is your own effort. Um, the founders knew that you can't just have a science of government that has three branches and get it all like a good machine, that you have to also condition people for moral character. Um, all right. Thomas Paine created a manual for public devotion, uh, but omitted any biblical passages. Um, but it included Confucius and other Eastern poets. So that's interesting to me. Um, he said that the New Testament was good, but Confucius taught the same thing uh, 500 years earlier, and he had more teachings. Um, all right. Okay. And, and the, the last thing is that you can't just rule by force, and you can't feel like your country is secure just because you have a military against outside attacks. So really, the virtue of people within the country is the best way to have a stable and secure society. OK, then I had you write, read the emotional intelligence article. And the thing that annoys me is that people make millions of dollars writing these books. And I've been around for a while, and every few years there's another one that comes out. And the guy, guy usually, makes millions of bucks, and you read it, and it's the same old thing. It just sounds. <coughs> <coughs> exactly like Aristotle, Confucius, you name it. Um, and I don't know. I. That's what liberal education should be, that you get it in college and you don't, you're not sort of looking for a guru, the latest guru who's going to exploit your worship, your hero worship, and make a lot of money. I don't even know how many of those people really do think that they're inspiring people to be better or if they're cynical and they just know, I know what to say and how to behave so that people will buy my book. <laughs> and that's really hard for me to know. People might change their mind. Uh, it's, too, it's too iffy. The human mind is too unpredictable and fluid for me to make any kind of claims like that. So delaying gratification, that's temperance. Tolerating conflict, this would be courage, situations involving fear um, or anger. Don't seek conflict, don't avoid it. The mean between extremes, maintain your composure, um, withstand personal attacks, um, and always behave for the greater good. Don't get distracted, stay focused. Uh, you're judiciously creative, courageous, right? Exactly. Like that's so much what Aristotle said. You're willing to speak out, say what no one wants to hear, and then you speak wisely, you say the right thing at the right time, in the right place, to the right people, in the right way, for the right reason. So <laughs> that is straight out of Aristotle. You're in control of your ego but you admit when you're wrong and you're willing to do things someone, someone else's way just to make, maintain harmony. Always satisfied, always never satisfied, always improving. Recognize when things are broken. Take responsibility for your work. And your marketable means that you're liked by your coworkers. You have integrity. 
You represent the company and the brand to the public, and you know how to neutralize toxic people. Um, that's it. So my point there is that we keep reinventing the wheel. And we, again, we have to go back to the human condition. But the more recent text, of course, women read it non-white people read it, people read it from any sort of ethnicity and sexual orientation. So people who read those books assume that it's a much more inclusive and egalitarian society and that those general principles or that piece of advice, those words of wisdom, they have it pictured completely differently in their minds because they've experienced the completely different. It's what they learned growing up is a much more egalitarian and inclusive uh, culture around them. Um, and then the news, this is interesting. <clears throat> Let's see. So this is again, the stages of development um, and the inner life of a Confucian is um, examining self-examination and here's the article that I did the outline on. There's George Washington's rules. But this one is about the, the ruler of China at this time. And I read an entire book about this, which is why I think you should, <clears throat> you should know that in your lifetime, probably not too, too long from now, there will be a lot of animosity between the US and China. And I would say don't overreact and don't buy into, um, I don't know, jingoism or false patriotism. Um, to me, the, the way to address it is some combination of diplomacy, intelligence, and then military at the ready, right? You start out with diplomacy, you make sure your intelligence community gives the diplomats the intelligence they need, because you can't have a diplomatic solution if you don't know what's really going on and you don't, and you don't know if the person across the table is lying to you or not. So you have to have good intelligence. And then the military is fa a failure of diplomacy. Military isn't a solution because it usually just creates more animosity. Also, it, it's blood and treasure. I mean, we lose our people, we lose a lot of money. Um, so keep it in mind when, when it hits, when there's probably gonna be a big standoff over Taiwan. But let's look at it from just see what's going on within China, Chinese history and culture, as if you can do that in two days. But just the absolute bare bones um, idea. So he, since he became chairman of the party, he's vowed a great rejuvenation to restore China to its ancient prominence and glory. I mean, this is so amazing because, of course, that's exactly what Confucius did. And he is stepping right into that. And he knows this. He knows what he's doing. It's just that once you've read the Analects, you know what he's doing. Um, and I'm, you know, people who haven't read the Analects are going to read this and go, okay, whatever. Um, and then you have to remember, you know, to what extent did Donald Trump do that when he kept saying, we're going to make America great again? So the MAGA movement. Is that appealing to that same belief to restore America to its earlier prominence and glory? And that's an open question. Uh, it's just something I want you to think about. You can present um, about any, anything you want, of course. I would like you, right? You can respond certainly to what other students are saying, but also after you do that, make sure to bring the thing that you brought because assuming that all nine of you brought something different, then we can have nine different perspectives. But if you just react to what each other says, then the, the, it's a different perspectives on 
a much narrower uh, range of issues. So feel free to do both, but make sure you come with something um, that's your own. That's what you care about. That's what I want to make sure. Um, all right, so China is on the rise. It's the second largest economy. It's engaged in global trade. It's got a, a roads. It's got this huge infrastructure program where they're building infrastructure in Africa and um, Southeast Asia. And um, they're the politicians in each country, they sort of bribe them into doing it or the Africans actually, many of them prefer China to the US because China is giving them stuff, infrastructure, which is really important for them. They need roads and bridges. Um, so uh, apparently Chinese TV is becoming more and more popular. So in a lot of ways, America conquered the world through its culture, its movies, Hollywood, all that sort of stuff. And now, uh, then India had Bollywood and all that. But now China is stepping in and they have all their own TV shows. And people in Africa apparently are watching Chinese shows. So whatever the future holds for that would be interesting. Um, so the Chinese people are realizing their dreams. Um, Okay, he's modern. Okay, he's also be getting a lot more military. Um, and that's important. China has not been very strong militarily in the past. Everything with China has had to do with trade. So it's Belt and Road, uh, $1 trillion, okay, in infrastructure for people that really appreciate it. Um, okay. And then he insists, however, on single party rule. And um, the thing about single party rule, again, the philosophers are the first to go. I would never advocate this. But the problem is when you have one mind behind everything, the policies all fit together really well and they can streamline. Whereas for us, our environmental policies go one way and then a different, there's an election and they go the other way and there's an election and it goes this way. A lot of our policies, right? They just keep switching and it's very unpredictable and that might be good or it might be bad. Um, the she, however, is has a very global, very um, complex, and future-oriented plan, and he just can initiate it because he has the power to do that. Um, let's see, he also is, um, is engaging in more control of the news media, the internet, and all that sort of stuff. And that's really the downside. Um, and the people in China, okay, 400 million of them are better off than they were. They're not desperate anymore. So, and then they see the U.S. and she will point out, you know, look at the U.S. falling apart. Look at all the shootings and all that stuff. And so why should we, he ask them, why question the Communist Party? Because the alternative is chaos and corruption. And, you know, it would be compelling to a lot of Chinese people. Um, all right, so what about Mr. Xi? He's referred to in this, this um, word that is a reverent Chinese word for a leader. It was also used by Mao, but Mao himself had the Little Red Book, which was analogous to Confucius analytics, uh, analytics, right? A little book with these little one sentence words of wisdom. Um, and now she is also presenting himself in this way as the benevolent leader, right? Not a strong man, uh -uh, cultivated man. Um, and he's on this mission to make China number one. Um, 
Okay, so this is the other point. He links Mr. Xi to the older Chinese traditions, especially Confucianism. So he's sort of making himself into a modern Confucius. Um, let's see, Mao, during the communist revolution, people associated Confucianism with the emperor and oppression. So communist revolution, the proletariat, the workers revolution are gonna take over. And Mao is going to be the leader of the workers, not the emperor, but he still took on this aura of being a leader because that would appeal to the cultural tradition that would punch people's buttons. And so they're used to having a leader that they can worship and uh, who, whose job is to harmonize, right? That's his job. I don't think, I don't know how many Americans, if that's the priority for why they vote for who they vote for. Um, okay, so he runs the country as if it were his own family. Like, All right, so that sounds very um, Confucian. This one, yeah, is about his power grab. So now he's, he doesn't have to step down from power. He's been appointed for life. And so the point here is that, um, that there are a lot of countries around the world at this moment that are tilting toward authoritarian government. And uh, Putin, Egypt, Turkey, uh, Hungary, Poland, I was in Hungary, right? I was in Poland and I was in Turkey uh, and I was in Russia and I was in China and all those countries are now way more authoritarian than they were and I don't plan on going back. Um, when I was there was a time 10, 15 years ago when it was cool to open up like this was every country was sort of fighting to see who could be the most open in terms of uh, intellectual freedom, freedom of speech. So they would have all these conferences with all these international intellectuals and, you know, feed us and give us parties and have, you know, give us space in a sort of nice building. Hall, hall for our meetings. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and the U.S. can't can't preach because we ourselves are a declining democracy, um, according to the scales. I mean, there's reasons why we people observers. There's a international observers who use a set of criteria to establish whether a democracy is, is getting better, a country is moving more in that direction or away from it. And since our country is moving away from it, um, we can't preach to China. We don't have the moral authority that we used to have. Um, so we're reverting to authoritarianism, many countries in the world today instead of liberal democracies. Um, uh, okay, so Matt, uh, Michael McFall was interviewed and he just talks about this decline, the trend toward authoritarianism. Um, it's based on insecurity and fear because of globalization, technology, being disoriented and, and also the terrible wages that people in McDonald's and other places, working class people, the wages and the benefits are really awful. You can't live on them, which a number of students have pointed out. So people really want to elect somebody that will fix it. Um, he claims that he's the only person who can really put China on the map, you know, make China great again. Um, and that's, that's a very powerful political position to be in. This one is about the constitution of China, that China has different values than we have, and they don't care, right? They're, they're not going to change because we are not the gold standard. So 
uh, the way of humane authority. So there's three branches to humane authority, the legitimacy of heaven, which is a natural foundation for morality. It's universal, it's transcendent, but it's natural. The legitimacy of earth, which comes from history and culture, and the legitimacy of the human, which is people uh, choosing to do what the leader says at that moment, right? So the first one is fitting ourselves into the broader harmony. The second one is knowing our history and culture. And the third one is making immediate decisions relative to these circumstances, but also that fit in with history and culture and fit in with the great harmony. Um, let's see. Uh, the, so he's just describing these three branches um, and they would have checks and balances. So you have three branches of government, checks and balance system, but it's different. So, and this I think is really important because the man who wrote it, 2009, he really knows what our weaknesses are and China's strengths are. And so I think he's very good at, um, at, you know, comparing his country to ours in a way that of course is favorable to China. But for me, that it's just a really good thought experiment that, oh, we should re-examine ourselves. So it's a chance for America, Americans to re-examine themselves. Is it really true that the Chinese are more likely than we are to seek the truth from the facts. Um, because, you know, we have all these scientists or whatever. And um, he's saying that that whole tradition of educated employees and who are encouraged to be scholars, they have a habit of acting on facts. Whereas um, the US and Russia is sort of capitalism good, communism good. It's not fact-based, right? Let's get to the facts and let's just talk about how you develop a country. Um, and the, what the Chinese are doing is modernizing China. And first they're going to modernize it and then they'll democratize. Maybe, maybe not, right? But we're starting out with lifting people up into the middle class by going toward high tech. Um, the primacy of people's livelihood. I mean, it would be very hard for people not to like this government since poverty eradication, getting rid of poverty is the most fundamental right. And they, they did it, right? I don't know how much our politicians talk about that. Not that much. Um, certainly not as a top priority or a right. And then as a matter of fact, to lift that many people out would make the citizens loyal to their government. I don't think they're going to uh, look under the surface all that carefully if they know you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I know what my experience is. I remember when I was in China, um, I was in Beijing for, I went there two different times. And I was a visiting scholar one of those times and I was just on a tour. But I remember I was in a, a train station and they have amazing trains. Um, and this grandpa had this little two, three-year-old kid on his lap. And they were looking at his iPhone. And I just felt like, yeah, that grandpa is going to condition those kids to love that technology because that's what lifted them up. Um, all right. So this is a neglect in the human rights in the West. We don't have, we don't have, um, workers rights like you don't have a right to a job um and in some of the states they're called right to work states 
the employers have a right to fire you without giving any reasons. And, you know, that's, that's not what China has. China has people who get jobs. Uh, they think holistically. It's seeing how all the pieces fit together and having it work together. Uh, priorities and sequences. So you prioritize and then you this first and this second uh, and you streamline, right? And you keep people from, keep things from falling apart and keep people trusting the government and trusting each other because they're not afraid of each other, right? They can work together. They put in a situation where they can work together. Government is a necessary virtue. Right? It's not this minimal government position, um, of course. So, and the flaws, um, okay. Oh, well, his main thing is we still have work to do, right? We still have banking corruption. We still have to work on renewable energy. And definitely there's going to be a race for who who gets to sell green products on the market, on the world market, and make the most money? That is going to be a big deal in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, good governance matters more than democracy. So as long as you're ruling for the benefit of the ruled, again, this is very Aristotelian, it doesn't matter if the officials are elected or not, if they actually use their power to benefit people. Whereas in a democracy, people can vote, but they're only voting for their selfish desires. They're not using the power they have to rule for the benefit of everyone. They're using the power they have to help their friends and harm the enemies, which is, you know, that's corruption. If you have communism or capitalism, whatever, it's all about how the power is used. Um, the world's China has the world's fastest growing economy. And of course, that's going to work. People are going to be loyal to that performance legitimacy. So though he says the way we have it structured, it doesn't matter who your daddy is. It matters based on your performance. If you perform well, you get a position. Um, Okay, selective learning and adaptation. So we have a secular culture, so we don't pray to God or claim to pray to God, uh, but we have, we have this tremendous commitment to helping other people, helping each other, and we learn from each other. It's this whole image, right? People get along, they trust each other, they encourage each other, they have goodwill for each other, they talk to each other, they deliberate together. And they have a diverse society, but they get along. It's not an adversary politics. It's not competitive and adversarial. All right, so they have problems and they can learn from the West, but he says actually the West could also learn from them. Um, and so that's for you to think about. Um, and I would like you to write something, to bring something to class where you have a reaction to that. So that's the video for today.